for all the people on uh, this panel uh, and people listening, I hope that wherever you are in the world, you are safe and healthy. I'm delighted to moderate this debate because uh, I think I have a, a strong interest in uh, diversity and inclusion matter, uh, being in the strategy, implementation, awareness about diversity, inclusion and equity matters. And also because I think aviation is an awesome industry and I would like to see it be become more diverse, uh, more inclusive, and to see in the future uh, all the color of the rainbows at the leadership and all over this industry. When I uh, posted that I was going to moderate uh, uh, this panel, a friend who worked in aviation uh, contacted me and told me that it was a bad time. So thank you, uh, uh, Daniel and Ayasa, for organizing this. She told me I should push the boundaries, but uh, to reassure the panelists, no worries, that would be nice. I'm always nice. But I want to say thank you and kudos to uh, to you for joining uh, uh, and pushing this discussion further, because you are the future of the industry, uh, you are the president of the industry, and you are the one that can make uh, things happen. With me today, uh, our panelists, we have uh, Brian Kenna. Brian is a student in aviation management and a committee member at IASA. We have uh, Adolfo Penzato. Uh, Penzato. Adolfo is the head of human resources for UK and Europe at Unique Caribbean Holidays UK Limited, an affiliate of Sandal Resorts International. We have uh, Jerry Butler, president of ISTAT, International Society of Transport Aircraft Trading, and the CMO of Merck's Aviation. And we have Jason Sherlock, director of development at DCU Educational Trust. Thank you all for being here today. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me to stop talking and dive into the most interesting part, which is all of you panelists, my first question may be starting with uh, Jerry. Can you tell us a bit more about you and why you are interested or involved in uh, promoting diversity and inclusion, especially from the leadership side? Yeah, so um, thanks, Isabel, and good morning, everybody. Um, good evening from Singapore. Um, and again, reiterate what Isabel said. Hope everybody is is healthy, safe and well. I know a lot of people here in Ireland at the moment and maybe listening in. And I know you're going through a, you know, a bit of a torturous time with phase five. Um, so, you know, um, best of luck with all that. And uh, certainly my heart goes out to everybody there. So without further ado, so I'm going to speak with a few hats on today, um, namely that as being, as Isabel said, being ISTAT president. ISTAT is the world's largest non-profit society for commercial aviation. We've got about five and a half thousand members. I'm the chief marketing officer of a global aircraft leasing business called Merck's Aviation, who is owned by one of the world's private equity firms called Apollo Global Management. And lastly, I suppose, but most importantly, is the father of a young girl who wants to be an astronaut called Zara. I said, it's on this last point that I started my, uh, my journey of greater discovery, essentially, into diversity and inclusion. When Zara was born about 11 years ago, I started to look at the world um, quite differently and just started seeing it from my little girl's perspective. Um, I know possibly a few other people in executive positions have said that before. So I said it was frightening to see the roadblocks in place for um, for girls and also the attitude of some people, even in this day and age. I said I'm I'm fortunate also to be married to an American Asian. So you know from the get go, our view at home has always been to provide a very open view to the world for both our kids. I said without knowing it, essentially we were preaching diversity is good, and we we're also preaching that inclusivity is positive, particularly in playground and running around. So without really understanding a huge amount about it in terms of the learned sense, we were we were imparting that knowledge um, on our on our kids. Um, so parking that aside as a backdrop for the moment, I said when my career trajectory started really taking off over the last, I suppose, 10 years, it became obvious to me that people would actually listen to me. And more surprisingly, that people actually were kind of interested in what I was going to say. Um, and I said, you know, with that, with power, essentially comes great responsibility. And when I became president of ISTAT, I realized that I had a significant platform to try and implement a better approach and to a more diverse and inclusive culture within aviation, but specifically within ISTAT. Our membership reach, as I said, is over five and a half thousand. It includes representatives of all C-suite levels across all the major representative commercial aviation businesses from airlines all the way down to MROs. Um, so my view is basically that if you're able to have a positive influence on one person, the knock-on effect of that can be mind-blowing, right? Um, so if I'm able to go and have a 
positive conversation about DNI to the chief executive of a major airline, and he parts that knowledge or twists his, you know, maybe that twists his head, but changes his view slightly towards and goes a more active approach. He might have 50, 60,000 employees. They carry millions of passengers a year. So the reality is, is that we've got a very powerful platform, even though it might be only a handful of voices. So that became really interesting to me that, you know, that a small voice essentially has a huge knock on effect onwards. So at iStat, basically, we hired PwC to do a 360 on the organization, and we've started to implement a diversity and inclusion policy. We have a diversity and inclusion committee, and we have an engagement throughout the vast majority of the organization from our members and what we're trying to do. I said, this might sound like a small step, but it's taken years to get this far. There was nothing in place two years ago, and there was certainly wasn't even on the forefront of the organization's mind a number of years ago. But we're definitely making approaches to where we can we can get it to a better stage. I said, however, now we're now up and running, and there's been, I suppose, some low hanging fruit that we've been able to uh, pluck, such as we've set targets that 50 percent of our panelists have to be female. 50% of panelists need to have a better representation of the broader demographics globally. I said we're actively promoting DNI as a core initiative to all our members. Um, we're making our members aware of the benefits of, for, to them and their organization of diversity and inclusion. And through articles, through engagement, through things on the website. And also we're providing support networks to help people climb the ladder. Um, and we do that through a number of initiatives where we get... Um, where we get senior executives and members of either the board or friends of the board to come and help younger folks or help other people to essentially progress to their career in terms of using them as a sounding board. And now essentially even in the world darkened by COVID as we all know is that we're very focused in getting the message out as part of our ISTAT Learning Lab initiatives and not to put a plug in but if anybody here is a people who are budding aviation enthusiasts it's free there's loads of um, detail on that. He said everybody's pretty much asked about the, their thoughts on DNI and what they can do. And, and it's actually really interesting to hear some of the stories, some of them horrific, um, about that came back about DNI. And it just shows you how much is a, how much is an industry we have come, but we've got so much further to go. Um, said you'll all have heard of the, I suppose, the male pale stale acronym for aviation financing. We realized that 10 years ago, and I think, you know, Isabel would certainly talk to it, and Adolfo maybe as well, is that there were no DNI initiatives. There were no DNI committees. Probably even five years ago, it didn't exist, which is an extraordinary thing um, when you consider where we are today. I said diversity was nearly about, and this is, this is me being honest, diversity to us 15 years ago was how many monster lads were sitting in the office against how many monster lads like diversity was monster and if you had somebody from Galway it was definitely diverse it's just crazy when you think about that you're working in a global business reaching out to people with different cultures different ethnic backgrounds different sexualities and you're turning around to them and you're coming from this very narrow-minded Irish way of thinking about things and it never dawned on anybody until you know until quite recently that you know, we need to look at this. So I said, we're at the nascent of this journey. And so there's certainly people, there's certainly people who don't believe in it. However, that's okay. And um, we know it's the right thing to do. And it also takes it in our view, it helps not just make us better, but it makes other people better around us as well. We are not going to be able to drag everybody over into this quest. But you know what? 99% of the people believe it. I'm happy to leave those 1% of the people behind because they'll become dinosaurs over time. I said, we'll continue to move forward and develop as we progress. I said, no doubt we're going to make mistakes, but that's okay too. I said, once you have buy-in from the top, which I'll talk about a little bit later, from either CEO or the board level, you stand a really, really good chance of getting it right. It may take a bit more time. You may make mistakes, but that's okay. But ultimately, if you've got buy-in to know that this is the right thing to do, it's going to help your business or going to help the, help the standing of everybody there, then you've got, a great, you've got a great chance of making it succeed. I said, hopefully for me personally, I'm going to be a very small if we, uh, cog in this kind of big um, big kind of technology piece of technology that's going to revolve around and I can make a positive contribution to this development 
And hopefully when we see everybody coming into this industry that's in college now and progressing forward, that you'll be able to see it in a much, much better placement, diversity and inclusive perspective than certainly we see today and definitely the where it was five or 10 years ago. So Isabel, I'll hand it back. Uh, thank you, Jerry. I look forward to the moment when I will, I will keep spotting uh, for for your daughter as a future astronaut, and then I will. Be she, able doesn't, to post she doesn't. She doesn't. She doesn't know yet that the Irish Astronautical Society, or you know, they haven't. It hasn't been an Irish astronaut, I suppose, to space yet. But we're banking on the dual citizenship that she might get to NASA. But uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, you never know. You can. You have ten years <laughs> to make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, yeah. And, uh, and the backup is the is the US. But I look forward to see that. I'll keep an yeah, eye. Yeah. And posted that I knew about the story at the time. <laughs> and also, I love your Spider Man reference. <clears throat> <laughs> so, uh, uh, with great powers go great, come great responsibility, yeah. and you're more than a little cogs into the machine. So, uh, thank you for your great work. Um, now, I'm, I move to Jason. Uh, Jason, can you give us your point of view? Talk a bit about you, uh, where is your interest from DNI come from, and uh, what's the work that the uh, the Educational Trust is doing uh, on the other side to kind of bring the, the connect the dots. Yeah, thanks, Isabel, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in this morning. It's great to be a part of uh, of this great discussion, and it's a, an ongoing discussion, and it's great to, to see see it being highlighted. Um, I suppose my 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 part in the in this discussion, as as you mentioned, Isabel, my name is Jason Sherlock, uh, born and bred in in Dublin and Ireland. Uh, grew up in a single par parent family. Uh, my my father was was Asian, um, so I suppose that made me stand out uh, for a number of ways growing up and growing up as a child in the 70s and um, there wasn't as much kind of awareness um, in in terms of race or color or difference in that so thankfully things have um, ha have gotten better but it, it certainly gave me a good start and a good grounding when it comes to diversity and inclusion and on reflection um, I suppose as I was growing up I was always striving to be accepted um, I think that's something that's innate in everybody and it's something that I, I strive to be uh, to be accepted. Uh, I did it through sport. I was able to kind of fit in through sport because I always felt the better I played, the more people forgot what I looked like and they just were aware about uh, how good I was as a player. Um, so that helped to up to a point. But I suppose when I look at my, my background and being accepted, I think the difference I would make and I would encourage people to think about is it's not about fitting in. It's not about being accepted by fitting in. It's about being accepted by being able to stand out. And I think that's really important because we're all unique, we're all individual, and we all have qualities that we can bring to any environment. And I think the, the kind of the crux of diversity and inclusion for me is that acceptance for being you and being able to stand out. Uh, so I suppose that's my grounding in it. Um, again, looking back, I'm at an age where I kind of reflect back on things. Um, a big part of my journey was it was education and probably the lack of it. As I mentioned, I I kind of focused on sporting um, pursuits as a young person, and I kind of got to the stage at the end of my playing career where I kind of said, well, well, what now? What do I do? And it was probably at that stage um, I was lucky enough to get back to DCU to do an MBA. And that gave me a real opportunity to understand how important education is for obviously the students that are on this, but also for businesses. Uh, I suppose th there's a quest to kind of um, grow our kind of diversity inclusion pipelines, but that starts with having the qualifications. It's not the only qualification, but it certainly helps when, when you are looking to organizations um, in terms of your employability. So, so that was a big part of my kind of uh, development over the last number of years. Uh, I now work as a director of development with the ECU Educational Trust. And I suppose our role, we're a philanthropic office and we're there looking to connect uh, organisations and people with DCU. We believe that DCU is a, is a really great place to transform people individually as students, but also has a big impact in, in transforming society. And we all know, certainly at this time, um, there's a lot of ways that uh, we look to education um, to assist with society. So it's, an, it's a great place to be. Um, 
a big part of, of uh, what we do is we look for support for our DCU Access program. Um, a DCU Access, it's it's a program that provides um, education for, for students from socially disadvantaged areas. So again, when you look at diversity and inclusion, um, we have a cohort of just under 1,200 Access students at the moment. And out of those cohort, 52 of those, uh, 52, th those students were born in 52 countries outside of Ireland. So it really is a diverse and inclusive um, cohort of students. And again, that from, from my point of view, Jerry has spoken about from a corporate point of view and an organizational point of view, I suppose I'm going back a step where we're looking to empower and to engage uh, young boys and girls like Jerry's daughter in a school in a school class to say, listen, you can be an astronaut or you can be a scientist or you can be a pilot. And part of that journey is through education. So it's a, it's a great place to be. And again, it, it's really great for me because I'm front facing with students and I'm front facing with organizations. I'll have an opportunity to talk later about what organizations can do. But to the students out there, I think my, my reflections and the little things that I'd like you to think about is ultimately as students, we want you guys to be the best that you can be. I believe that DCU and other educational um, places can assist you on that journey, but it starts with you and it starts with your why. And again, you get up every morning, you, you go to class, you, you, you go to lectures, obviously virtually at the moment. Have a think about what's your why. Why are you doing it and where do you want to go? Um, because that will be the fuel that will allow you not only personally prosper, but it will also influence the people that you come across in your class, in your lectures and when you move into employment. So it's a really important thing. And I think the one thing that I look back on and I think that I had was that intrinsic motivation. I wanted to be the best that I could be for my reasons. And I'd kind of ask all, your, all the students out there today to have a think about that because that will be the fuel that will make you prosper and hopefully get into a career pathway in aviation in the future. As I said, I, I, I'd be happy as a bell if, if we have time to, to talk about some of the thoughts I would have from an organizational point of view. And thank you for letting me share some of my own thoughts. Thank you, Jason, for that. Thank you for sharing your, your journey uh, and, and your why. It's, it's very inspiring. And uh, also, uh, I think the, one of the things that I, I memorized is that the important to stand out and to be you. So I encourage everybody that there could be a closing sentence for this panel to uh, uh, or this, this conference to uh, to uh, embrace how awesome you are. Anyway, um, just to uh, to move to the next one, Adolfo Pensato. Uh, Adolfo, please do tell us about your awesome you and um, what's your interest in diversity and inclusion, especially from the point of, of, of HR, kind of the, the one that executes whatever is going to happen in terms of diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction, um, Isabel. Uh, thank you uh, to all of you as well for, for taking the time to join us today. Um, as Isabel said, from being in HR, my responsibility is not just the people's um, strategy. In my particular, in, in my company at the moment, it will be for UK and Europe. So we are present in three European countries: in Germany, Italy, and France, as well as the UK. But we also responsible, or I'm also responsible for um, creating the parameters and the policies and procedures that all our employees need to need to follow. But at the same time. We also need to ensure that everyone understands exactly what the policies are, such as diversity and inclusion, and we relay that to, to the staff. Now, I have been extremely lucky throughout my career, um, not just in HR, but before in HR um, in operations, when I used to work in the airline industry, to, to have worked for very good companies. That I am this that they understood the difference and the wealth that diversity actually brought in. Now, just to, to give you a bit of background on me, um, I'm Spanish born, I've been in the UK now for 23 years. Um, when I first came here, um, I came here just to, to learn the language and to to be honest, without much expectation. But my first role was in, in Delta Airlines as, um, as a reservation agent. Um, what I took from Delta Airlines was that this company in particular understood 
the, the wealth that diversity brought in. Every single person that worked in the, in the call center had to be bilingual to start with because we were actually handling the reservations from the entire Europe. So whether I would be um, speaking Spanish and English, that will be my, my, my region, but we will have about reservation, 300 reservation agents that handle 15 different languages. So when it comes to diversity, when it comes to inclusion, that is where I got the, the, the taste of what that looked like. As Jerry said before, 10 years ago, diversity and inclusion were just words. I don't think there was any possibility of implementing anything or people understood exactly what it is. When I moved from Spain to the UK, my experience, my initial experience was very good, as I said, in Delta Airlines. However, I've worked also for some companies in which probably I was the only foreigner within the company. And that is what Jason mentioned about trying to, to step out. You need to actually prove yourself a bit more. You need to, to show that you've got the skills and it's not only your, your accent that looks a bit or sounds a bit funny. Um, so what, when it comes to that, that is probably my experience having been or having worked in London, London being a multicultural um, metropolis is, is great. But as soon as you step out of London and I've worked in, in, um, in Gatwick Airport, what probably is not, is still multicultural, is still multinational but it's not London per se. And that is probably what, from my point of view, I saw a bit of a difference. I was the only person there that was not British and had a bit of an accent. Um, I still have it, by the way, but, um, and uh, that is where I felt like I had to actually show what I was capable of. And, in, you know, Jason said that he handled um, this diversity through sport. For me, having worked in the call center, mine was ticketing. I was a first agent. So first and ticketing was actually my, my forte. And that was recognized very strongly at the airport. And that is how I started fitting in. So that, in a way, that, that is my, my background, my experience when I moved countries. Now, in, in HR, it is my responsibility to ensure that now moving forward, diversity and inclusion is always out there. And I have to actually remind the managers when we hire someone, when we recruit someone, that it's not always good to hire the people, candidates that look like you, that think like you. This is where every time there is a hiring a campaign, I need to ensure that I balance everything that, that is going on, that I understand the culture of my company. And everyone that fits in here not only brings wealth to the company, but also is an asset to the company and is also a, an important benefit for the candidate itself. Mm -hmm. So moving forward for all of you that are finishing your degrees, when you move up there, it's very, very important that the companies that you want to go for, whether it is aviation or whether it is any other industry, it's important that <clears throat> that company reflects what you are. If you do not see yourself reflected within that particular company, it's, it's obviously your decision to, to see whether you want to go for it or not. Uh, but it is very, very important that if you want to go for it, as Jason said, try to be the best, strive to be up there and make a difference. Now, when it comes to, to companies as well, from the HR point of view, I need to balance out what is the policy and procedure and the law, what the equal opportunities law in that particular country states, but at the same time, always remember that this is a business. It's a business that's going to generate revenue. So it's try, try to, to balance out both elements. On one side, you know exactly that you need to be diverse, you need to be inclusive, and you need to provide all the resources to everyone that may not have had 
the same opportunities as other people. But at the same time, from the company standpoint, you also need to remember you're there to make money. So when it comes to the when it comes to the, the strategy of the company, the company will go for a specific profile or will go for the the audience that they're trying to attract to actually get money. My role is to actually balance everything out, whereas at the same time, yes, we're trying to attract this particular profile. On the other side, we also need to, to ensure that diversity and inclusion brings wealth, not just from a monetary standpoint, but also from a cultural standpoint. So my take home message for all of you is when you go up there to the labor market, be very specific and be very demanding with the companies that you're going for. Whether this company is stuck in the 20th century or they're actually grassroots moving into the 21st century, it's extremely important that you, you do your research and you know exactly what you're going for. So as, as Jason said, move you know, along the, this webinar, this, this, this video conference, we will talk about strategies, exactly what is going to, to help companies, but it's also going to help you manage, set your expectations, manage your expectations, but also create a career path for yourself. Thank you, Adolfo. Um, so the message important, I think, that I, I memorize is that playing on your strength mm -hmm. uh, and finding a company that reflects who you are. Uh, and also, I, I like your comment about the, the fact that diversity and inclusion bring wealth not only on the cultural side, uh, because it's, there is a lot of studies, I think it was the IMF and uh, Harvard Business Review that, that show that usually companies that are diverse tend to perform on the long term better than the other. So it's also a matter of survival. Complacency kills companies. So it's uh, really interesting as a point of view. Uh, thank you for that. Last but not least, Brian Kenna. Uh, hi, Brian. Talk to um, you about uh, talk to us about you and your interest in diversity and inclusion, especially if you look at diversity and inclusion when trying to apply for a job or building a career or not, uh, and see what, how important it is for the students, which are kind of most of our audience today. Yes, of course. Uh, well, I suppose my diversity and inclusion uh, journey stems from my, my my journey from secondary school to university and through um, into the part-time workforce, I suppose, and being exposed to people of different backgrounds uh, whilst attempting to find, I suppose, myself and develop myself. Um, and I suppose in our generation, I think the attitudes regarding to diversity and inclusion are quite positive, uh, particularly in relation to homosexuality and racial diversity. Um, and I put this down to us growing up in a more globalised society. Um, we grew up in a society where there's a lot more diverse people than previous generations. And um, we went to school with, 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 with different types of people and people from different places and cultures and it's I suppose we found it a bit easier to accept people um, in that regard and we noticed the differences in people less and maybe this has given us a better opportunity to, challenges, to challenge the stereotypes that we see in society um, and I suppose when we go to university that increases and we we leave the place where we, we spent most of our, our childhood and our teenage years in our secondary school and our primary school and we're exposed to a more diverse student population we meet people from different parts of the country from the world and we meet people from different social classes and religion and we immerse ourselves in a more diverse community in college um, and with some a, a community that provides us with friends from different backgrounds and very similar to what Jason spoke as was we can also see this through the clubs and societies that we might be involved in um, and we surround ourselves in this regard with people of similar passions and interests and the passions and interests I have found um, through my experiences are what enable us to form relationships and communities that overshadow and, and transcend our differences um, and that enables us to understand people and I suppose that's the pivotal point um, where through these diverse relationships we might gain a different perspective uh, we might gain a heightened respect for people of different minority groups and um, the same groups that maybe we previously stigmatized and we see that especially through uh, the different clubs and societies and sports that we all immerse ourselves in at some stage through our, our growing up especially in university a fundamental example of this um, on how clubs and societies and college would have broadened my own perspective would be taking it back to a very fundamental level. Uh, I went to an all-boys secondary school, um, so as a, an introverted teenager I didn't have that many friends that were girls. 
Uh, however, then when I went to college, uh, the people in my life and the relationships that I would have had were much greatly diversified. And I had to learn how to be friends with girls, how to interact with girls and how to understand girls. Um, so the, the relationships were diversified and I began to understand and you become more inclusive. And um, I suppose now many of my friends in my life are women. Um, and I suppose we can see that then from, from just that little example that how diversity and inclusion is brought out over over time and um, through understanding and through taking things from, from different perspectives. Um, and I think we, we see this in a, in a very powerful way, a mixed way, but a very powerful way through social media. Um, and it's just another thing that is exemplified within our generation um, is that we're exposed to political and social opinions of many people to the many people that we might be connected with uh, through these platforms and they enable us to be more aware and reflect upon the diversity within our communities. Um, I suppose while social media doesn't represent the general concession and everyone enables us to communicate um, maybe through the likes of infographics and Instagram on topics that we wouldn't have discussed in person previously um, and with that discussion over this this medium we're able to become more education, more well-rounded as a generation. And I think um, that is where we bring in our experience and our um, our diverse nature or our increasing diversity into the workplace. And that's a key thing that I'll, I will touch on. Um, but I suppose that's a brief background on where I've come from and, and my perspective on diversity and inclusion and why I'm, um, I suppose, advocating for, for such topic. Thank you for that. Uh, I think what, what's very interesting to see is that I, I will call you that in the aviation sector, you are diversity and inclusion 2.0 because you've been living in diversity. So for you, diversity is not even a question. Inclusion is the next step for you and the yeah. importance of inclusion. Uh, so that I think that's, that, that's a really great part. And, and also maybe saying that the fact social media allow you to see the world in a more globalized way and be touched to problems uh, that you wouldn't be thinking as other generation before. And also because you grew up in diversity that increased your level of empathy towards whatever is happening to others. So uh, that's that's a really interesting uh, point of view. And then just to stay on you on that and, and move to the next point um, on kind of uh, what are company doing, what works, what doesn't work. For your point of view now applying for job, when you look at a company website profile news or whatever, um, what works in terms of a diversity when you look at something making a speech about diversity or seeing a diverse board or seeing diverse management what what ah. kind of thing oh that company looks cool um i suppose it's the under the understanding um and i suppose you know it's well to have diversity and inclusion on a on, on the on the cso or brochure um but i suppose when we see diverse and inclusion we really look um at a, at a company we we're looking for something that fosters success from every type of person and that it enables people to grow um and by people growing and enabling um the students and the employees to grow to bring the organizations with them um and i think as students we need to bring our generational attitudes of acceptance into the workplace and we need to uh, constantly reflect on what is socially acceptable in the 21st century um, and we need to emulate this in everything that we do in the workplace. Um, now I suppose students we're not perfect we're not we don't have um, everything nailed down in terms of this and while I do speak of our generation as a very in a very in, in a a positive manner I think we surround ourselves with people that are similar to us and um, I think we can still push the boat on that and I think we can still um, we, we don't like to, we find it tough I suppose as students to go outside of our comfort zone um, and one area that I really see that in college is through group work and when we hear we have group work to go, we say, oh no, this is going to be a pain. Uh, we have to work with people, we have to listen to people, why can't we just do it ourselves? But I suppose this is even further amplified when we're put into random groups um, with people we don't know. And that's where we're pushed 
very far outside of our comfort zone. And I think that's where we still need to keep going um, to advance and to develop on the topic of diversity and inclusion. Um, well, we're with, if we're, if we're with the same people at the same time, we're working with similar people with similar goals uh, we, that we know and trust, but we're not developing. Um, there's no gain in diversity and inclusion. And I think as universities and in a strategic, um, a strategic, a strate uh, as a strategy to further develop this, I think we need to push ourselves to work with more diverse people from the young age and go outside of our groups. And um, I think by doing this and working on group projects with different people that we don't know, we were able to confront our own biases and consider their perspective of others, uh, challenge stereotypes and acquire that skills that will enable us to bring us into the workplace um, and contribute to a more diverse workplace. Um, and I think that's just one method that we could do um, to help us. So I suppose to the students that are listening now, just next on, on your next project, on your next um, interaction within the, the, the community, just think on how we can develop. Um, and I suppose the implications on the conversation that we're having now with how that might affect the workplace in the future. Okay, no, thank you for that. Um, so, for, based on the first question, you're looking for more than CSR, you're looking at a culture of diversity and inclusion, yeah. but also you, you, you said that uh, uh, you think that as a, uh, as a student and a future employee, or as a young person, the idea is to push the boundaries, being a promoter mm -hmm. of diversity within the company, so shaking things up, and I think it's it's good because yeah, people have to be outside their comfort zone, and you you and to to kind of make it the link to to Jason after what I think it was interesting, you mentioned uh, the, the 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 pain of group work, which could be the the, the pain of teamwork in a company, but also how uh, being diverse and pushing uh, co the comfort zone help to. To, to fight the, the single-mindedness of uh, of uh, and the group thinking. Um, so from a university point of view, so I'll move to Jason on that, uh, based on DCU, based on what just Brian said, uh, what do you do in terms of diversity and do you do more kind of like in group work to make a diversity group work to increase kind of this comfort zone and friction to push people to do better or what kind of diversity and inclusion uh, tools uh, are you working on uh, on on your side? Um, yeah, I just to Brian. I, I think it's so refreshing to hear his, his thought process and his attitude, and it's it's very it's very energizing in terms of the the minds of the future. Let's say, and and as you mentioned there, Isabel, I I I work for for DCU, so I get an opportunity to talk to people and organisations about D, DCU, and the feedback that I am very fortunate to get in terms of the students is so positive. Uh, there is a real connection in terms of the, the DCU graduates and how employable they are, which is great. And a lot goes into that inclusive nature of DCU. As I mentioned, uh, over 10 percent of our students come from a, a, an access to socially disadvantaged uh, background. So it, it, it really DNI is in is embedded in DCU and that comes out through not only the students but also through the, the academics and lectures and programs which in turn then creates these um, really employable students and I suppose that the two things I would pick up on in terms of the students um, from my, my, my experience is, is one there is a place for you in terms of your employability uh, when I speak to organizations and we ask what are the key challenges one of the first will always be talent pipeline and they are all looking for the new talent, the new ways of thinking. So be reassured that there is a place for you out there in the workplace in the workplace. I think this, the second the second thing I, I would I would refer to students to have a think about. And again, it's, it's picking up on, on Brian's thoughts is how you can be an agent of change. You know, th there was a time where people were happy to get a job because of the, the financial uh, the, 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 the check at the end of the week or the end of the month. 
nowadays our, our, our students are, are more informed or more aware that they're demanding more from organizations and they're asking the questions as Brian said it's not a, it's not good enough to have something in your CSR brochure what are you actively doing what do you care about how are you making a difference and they're all great questions that you should you should feel empowered to ask of any organization that that you are going to spend and commit to so i think from a student perspective that that's a really really worthwhile uh, thought to have and to think about then moving it on to businesses when it comes into this um, area i suppose a question i would have is is can businesses do do good and and can that in turn relate to to good business um, and and doing good, um, as I mentioned, I have conversations, philanthropic conversations, where we're asking uh, organisations to support uh, DCU. And thankfully, we have a number of um, supporters, uh, including the likes of ISTAT and, and, and thanks to Jerry and, and, and his thought process. We have a number of companies in the aviation industry and they want to give youth and they want to give diversity an opportunity. They see that this is an, a way of assisting their organizations in the future by investing and providing a, a, a opportunities for some of the socially disadvantaged. And, and that's really important and that's really a key. We have to provide an outlet and a platform for, for diverse and inclusive uh, students to, to get into our talent pipeline and our employee pipelines. And, and that's where it starts uh, from my perspective. So that's the that's the doing good that business can do. And obviously we, we really appreciate the supporters and we're, we're always looking for others. How that can relate to good business. I think what we're talking about here is one is your employee force. And again, if you have, and Jerry mentioned about in the past, where we have a typical demographic with a typical mindset, does that place your business in the right position to be creative, to understand challenges, to have a different thought process to, to everyone? Um, we all know where we get that little bit of gold dust where someone comes up with an idea or a thought that kind of comes from left field. And that can be really important to a business. And I think a cohort, a youthful cohort, a diverse cohort are really well positioned to challenge the kind of thought processes of a business and to assist with that decision making. So that's where I see kind of having um, a focus on diversity and inclusion can really help your workforce. On the other side is your customer base. We, we live in a global world now. We're, we're here. We're all connected this morning from all parts of the world. So our customer base has become more diverse. So if, as a business, for you to be able to respond and to be able to react to challenges and opportunities of your customer base, it's important that your profile of employees reflect that. And again, there are numerous businesses out there that they have always felt that we need a typical demographic, a typical uh, qualification, a typical area of, of the world that can assist their business. We need to challenge that and organizations need to challenge that. And as I said, that, that's how I would see how a company can do good, but also do good, good business by really promoting and really enabling their diverse and inclusive strategies. Thank you, Jason. Doing good and doing well. So it's not just an, an option. Um, summarizing, everybody can be an agent of change. Um, it's, uh, we have to feel empowered to push our organization to help them find their why and, uh, and be more than just a, a company that provide revenue, but that are uh, providing revenue, doing good and doing well at the same time. It's a, it's a matter of survival. Um, Adolfo, you're going to be the one having the tough question. Sorry about that. You're HR, so I wanted to obviously see what you do as a as a uh, as a HR in a company about diversity and inclusion, what you think works and what you think don't work. But the, the tough question for you is kind of um, what do you think about uh, providing data, publicizing data, and committing? Uh, that's more an American uh, company type of profile, but saying. This is where we are in terms of diversity. So this is the norm. That's what we are trying to go. And we know we are failing or we are great and we are going to do more. What, is it something that, because I, I have a, um, I'm saying, asking that because I have a framework for a company, so not in aviation, 
they decided to publicize uh, diversity without communicating, and they realized that they had 0.2% women in leadership. And it was publicized for two, three days on the website till someone saw that and said, are you crazy? Take it out. <laughs> so just, uh, just for you. <laughs> Well, um, that, that is a very good point because obviously before you take that approach and you take that amazing step, which in theory is great, um, and obviously there is a good intention behind that, um, what the result was is actually <laughs> it backfired. Uh, why did it backfire? Well, probably because there was not much thought through the entire process. So before a company wants to include diversity and inclusion, I think they need to do a lot of homework. They need to do a lot of research. They need to understand exactly what kind of culture they want to, to provide, not just for, for the employees, but they also want to see what image they want to, to give out to his um, to its customers and clients. So, what I would say to, to, to the companies out there is first, create your vision. What is going to be your mission? Every company has got a vision, everyone has got a mission and a statement. Whether they actually follow it to the letter is something completely different. So when you have a vision, when you have a mission, stick to it. Ensure that what I mentioned before, you've got your strategy, but you also need to generate revenue. So this is why, as a company, you need to challenge the, 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 the status quo. You need to challenge exactly what has been happening before and after. In terms of data generation, you need to crunch your data, your numbers first, before you put together any strategy whatsoever. HR is going to, to go there to advise, and it's going to, to go there to state the law, the regulations, what's going to happen but it needs to be the top layer that needs to be, that needs to buy into this. If the top layer doesn't, it doesn't really matter how much data you put into place. It doesn't really matter how much data you want to publish to your employees, to the labor market, it's never gonna work. So the most important thing for, for companies is that when you have your mission, when you have your strategy, that the top layer, I'm talking about the, the chairman, the GMs, the senior management team really is has actually bought into it. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. Yeah, thank you for that, Adolfo. So do your homework and get the buy-in. And uh, in talking in buy-in, let's go to Jerry. Uh, as a leader of organization, how do you provide buy-in? What are the strategy? I know that you said you're already doing a lot of diversity and inclusion, but uh, what you do, what you do? How do you get buy-in? And based on what you already put in place, what works and what doesn't work? Yeah, thanks, Isabel. And I put a few notes here together, so if it looks like I'm reading some stuff, I am reading some stuff because it's quite a challenging topic. And I've just um, I wanted to start a little bit in reverse and kind of say, well, what does a company actually get from the successful implementation of a DNI strategy? And that I think that's a useful starting point because it's a useful kind of to understand what the end point is, and then we can kind of figure out where we're going to get there. So employees will en employees will engage in their unconscious bias. I said remarkably, I said you know people will actually you know, experience this euphoria or unusual change where their um, interpersonal relationships will improve. Your, your relationship with the person next to you or over here, left or over right is actually going to get better. I said, and you'll do it without even knowing you're doing it. You won't even be aware that you're doing it. And it'll become actually, you know, and this kind of might sound a little bit flowery, is that it becomes quite an emotionally liberating experience for the employee. I said, secondly, I said, you get an enhanced employee engagement. I said, if diversity initiatives are truly engaged, then the organization can fully engage each individual. I said, a stronger and deeper engagement with employees enables much greater job satisfaction and improved results, not just by the individual, but also by the company. I said, thirdly, I said, you get increased innovation and creativity. And going back to what Jason said earlier, um, you know, every company, like, 
that I've ever worked for wants to be innovative, wants to be creative, wants to have an ability to be flexible and change the world, right? And ultimately wants to be profitable. So the workplace that encourages not just race, gender, and cultural diversity, but also thought diversity will foster greater innovation. And I said, and the one key point I would say specifically about that is all ideas are good ideas, right? And everything should be thrown into the basket and we'll figure out what are the better ideas. I said, fourthly, I said, cl- having a clarity in defining business objectives was something what Adolfo was saying. So the creation of a business that becomes adaptable and is resilient to external forces and pressure is far better than a, than a, a non-diverse business or inclusive business. And lastly, and most importantly, in the aviation side, I said it's an ability to thrive in this multicultural environment. If you think about aviation, I mean, you know, we've got... Um, you know, whatever it is, 120, 130 aircraft on lease to 57 airlines globally in all the, all the continents of the world, apart from Antarctica, um, although it feels like some of them should be there at the moment. And I said, you know, the ability for an employee to be able to connect with each of those individuals, understand them, understand the culture, understand the background is extremely important. important. Um, I said, we've established, I said, that a business that embraces diversity, it says is a positive. And I said, how, but I said, essentially, the key question is, how do you go actually about implementing it? I said, you know, a lot of this, I'm not an expert in. I've picked up this, you know, over the last number of years. So, you know, I'm trying to still a little bit learn on the job. I said, firstly, I said, it's important. And probably the most important thing is to get purchase and buy in from the CEO and from the board. So without that, you ain't getting past go. I said, once you achieve that, and once you get that buy in, it's important to get um, buy-in from these other stakeholders such as senior management but also from the staff so from the grassroots up people need to buy into the idea that this is what the board wants this is good for the business and you explain the rationale why he said you can use tools such as simple staff surveys to better understand dni and um, you know understand what's important to everybody you can get focus groups together so that they can understand essentially and zero in and you know what uh, the broader established priorities are going to be. And I said, you know, one, and so we'd undertake, and most importantly, and everyone's guilty of it, you know, is unconscious bias training. And I know, Isabel, we've talked about this before, so that people understand how bias creeps into every aspect of your lives. I said, and we don't even know about it. I'm guilty about it all the time. You know, whether you're going into a shop and you go left or you go right, or you go this way or that way, it just creeps in. So we need to embrace the understanding that there is a bias there and we need to be able to provide tools to employees to be able to understand how they can overcome that or at least recognize it. I said it's important particularly with gender that this shouldn't become a them and us situation. I said it's crucial to have male allies. I said you know while all of this is interesting it really means nothing unless it can be measured. Now I know there's a massive debate going on, you know, in the media and everything else about targets versus quotas. Um, I lean more on the target side of the house. In my experience, companies gravitate more towards targets. Um, but, you know, it's it's an open debate still, still in play. I said, now, withstanding this, it's important to implement measuring tools and establish whether the varying strategies for DNI are successful or not. If you don't measure them, it's difficult to chart progress because everything remains subjective. And that's a crucial point in implementing any strategy within a business. So it's also important, as I've discussed, to bring the male, pale and stale staff um, on this journey. So those who are enlightened will, will see the benefit and embrace it and regard it not just as a threat. I said, ultimately, and I've said this before, everyone's not going to get it. But I said, once there's buy-in from the top, there's going to be a positive sh- cultural shift. It will happen. So you don't need 90, you don't need 100% of the people on board. People will be left behind, but that's okay. Leave them to be left behind. If they want to conform and they want to see the new, the, the new way, um, or not say it's a new way, but the proper way of doing things, then they will come on board. If they don't, then they're going to get left behind and that's going to be detrimental to them, to their careers and to where they want to go as well. So, you know, you'd be surprised how many people will realize the errors of their ways. It's not about just the right thing to do because most, but it also makes businesses extremely dynamic. It's said a, a more enjoyable place to work and provides them a competitive advantage, particularly in aviation, which is a global business. So in order to sum up, 
I think it's important to remember what DNI represents. So there's many ways to go down this path, and this is something is relatively new, and you know it's newish to me, but it's been continuing developed. I said diversity to me is everything that makes us different from each other. So diversity is more than just our physical differences or our preferences; it is shaped by our backgrounds, beliefs, values, feelings, personalities, likes, dislikes, life experiences, and social upbringings. Inclusion represents an organization where every person is valued where the individual, where every, every person is a key member, every individual is a key member of the organizational community, and most important, where difference is something that is seen as a major competitive advantage. As Jason said earlier, and I noted it down, he said it's not about fitting in, it's about being accepted for standing out. I think that's a brilliant phrase, and you know, if, yeah, I would encourage people to think about that on a go-forward basis. So the inclusion is about bringing out the real value of difference, and creating a culture where everyone senses a piece of belonging. They can contribute to the organization's success and ultimately, and most importantly, can thrive in their careers. So being diverse and inclusive company should be the top of every business's agenda. And as Brian said earlier on, it's not just about putting a CSR thing on your website and saying, tick that that box is that it's actually about it's, it's about embracing it and it's about driving it through and what will happen is is you'll find that the business will find this an amazing cultural transformation there'll be a greater sense of belonging for all the individuals there'll be more there'll be more valued and respected parts of the team there'll be a stronger work cohesion the ability to perform functions will be will be far better and will be far quicker they'll be more expedient in making decisions and i said this, the most importantly it's not just an impositive for the employee, but it's also a massive positive for the employer and a massive competitive advantage. So, you know, to sum up, I think that, you know, the reality is, is that we are living in a world that needs to be transformed. I am encouraged by what I'd heard from Brian and Ron on the DCU side that, you know, kids these days, you know, when you're in secondary school or in high school, is that they're living in a more diverse, wor diverse world. But I've seen some examples where, you know, where that just doesn't exist, where people, you know, you know, segregate themselves all from other people and kids and they're not used to it. And it just, it, it baffles me when, you know, as Jason said earlier, when you see these, you know, when we're all exposed to everything that's wrong and right in the world, you know, you know, there's a lot of gray area, but there's a lot of, you know, black and white in terms of what's wrong and what's right. And still people pick paths that are non-diversive, that are non-inclusive. And it just, it's mind blowing to me. So ultimately there's going to be people who will be left behind. There's going to be people who won't fit in the box. You know, to I'd say to everybody here, there's going to be companies who aren't going to fit into the box as well. Don't be discouraged by that. I said, you know, there's an opportunity here. And as Jason said, where, we want people coming into this space. Aviation has never seen a uh, 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 distress like we're going through at the moment. Do not be discouraged by that. We want good people. We want smart people. We want diverse people. We want people to come in to change the world. I said, you, everybody here, I can't see everybody who's listening on, listening on the call and Brian and all your colleagues and everybody else, you have the ability to change aviation. You have the ability and smarts and brains because A, you're privileged. You've gone to secondary school. You're now in, you're now in third level education. You're probably on. You think about other people in the world. You're in a fantastic position to be able to go and conquer things and do things. And certainly, I look forward to welcoming everybody and anybody and seeing you. And hopefully, at some days at conferences or hallways and just having a chat with you. And you know, but the one thing, don't get discouraged about what you're reading in the papers about aviation. We need lots of people, and we need lots of people like yourselves as well. Thank you, Jerry. I think you summarize everything, uh, even even this this kind of panel. So I will just add addition for diversity and inclusion 3.0. <laughs> I will add uh, equity, um, which is kind of more on Adolfo's side is diversity. Everybody's there. Inclusion. Everybody has a seat at the table who can be themselves and thrive. Equity, making sure that unconscious bias don't hinder the career progress of each individual. Um, and uh, just to summarize what everybody said, be you, be your awesome self and find a company that embrace how great you are. If the company has embraced that, the company doesn't deserve you. Um, I know that we talk too much, so we don't have a lot of time uh, for this type of, uh, I don't know if you have time for a question, Daniel, just tell me if you have, we can uh, have some Q&A or if we have to 
wrap up. We, we have run over time, but if anybody does have any questions, if they want to send them to info at iasa.aero and we'll pass them on to the, the panelists then and get some responses for them. But that's, okay. that's the panel done now. So. Okay, so uh, I'll just wrap up because uh, it's always it's always great to speak loud so we don't get any awkward questions. Strat <laughs> strategy. It's a strategy that wasn't <laughs> planned. So um, each member, if you want to have for thirty second kind of wrapping up uh, about this conversation, thirty second, please. <laughs> so we'll start with Jason. Yeah, I'll be I'll be less. I'll, I'll give uh, I'll give Jerry a bit more time. Um, I think it, it's great. I suppose the ideal scenario is that we don't require these conferences about or events about diversity and inclusion. That we embed them into our organisations. Uh, we all have a part to play. We we all have a part. Whatever side of the fence you think you are, we all have a part to play to to challenge and provide solutions. And all I'd say is approach every situation, every challenge with an open mind and an open heart. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Brian. Yeah, I suppose like Jason said, we all have a part to play. And as students, what we do now in university is going to shape um, the workplace. And I suppose. Um, educational institutions and how they um, embrace diversity and inclusion will shape how students um, create a more broader broader perspective understanding and then will go on to shape uh, the workplace so what we do now is going to impact what we do, what we get in five years time and I think that's what we really need to look towards and what we really need to work for. Thank you Brian. Adolfo? Uh, from my point of view, it's the unconscious bias, and, and this is something that I want to stress a lot. It's, we're all guilty of it. We all have our biases. It's very, very important that we all realise that we have it, and in doing so, try to fix that. So give someone the opportunity to, to show themselves what they can actually do, as opposed to just spend your 15, 20 seconds deciding already what this person can cannot do. Um, there will be training up there and so on, but as long as you realize that we all do it, it's just, you just need to reel back and think, hold on, let's give this person an opportunity to know exactly what they can do. For me, that will be the, the take home. Like that, if everyone does that, we would not need movements like Me Too, BLM, or anything along those lines literally everything will be fixed if everyone does it but that is the most important thing is start with yourself and all looking at you doing that will change themselves thank you adolfo jerry 30 seconds so so yeah so i've got a bunch of and I, what, what are them i suppose because i talk a lot <laughs> uh, it's, um it's gonna be funny for a lot of people so we've got a bunch of students on here so i kind of wanted to direct it more not just about dni but also about students to kind of give people a bit of hope is uh, four things dream big okay because they'll actually come true i said you know life is about roundabouts right at this point in time in your life you've got hundreds of exits right <laughs> as you go through life the exits get shorter and shorter in terms of what you can take. But don't believe that just because you don't get this job, or you don't get this interview, or you don't get this thing over here, that suddenly everything is shut down. The roundabout still, the, the exits off that roundabout still exist, depending on what decisions you're going to make. So there's always opportunities. Read a lot, right? Read everything you're given, everything that goes on your desk, continues reading. And two, and this is going to be a laugh because I talk a lot, is two ears, one mouth, right? Okay, so listen to everybody engage with people understand things you know appreciate things take it in and then i said you know obviously you speak when you speak when you're meant to be talking to but just t take everything in there are opportunities for everybody in this call in aviation aviation is a massive massive business we live in a country well in ireland where there's a huge opportunity for everybody there it's a core fundamentalist part of the business it's part of it's a major growth as part of the government's plan and a go forward in the next five years of the go forward basis so we need people like you in this in this industry and i really look forward to hearing someday over the next number of years going you know i listened to this crazy guy with big ears from singapore talking to me about uh talk to me about aviation or you can't see them now thank you jerry uh so i will take out my my moderator at for 30 seconds and then i'll take my uh my moderator at again i just want to thank you guys because 
As a person who worked in aviation in uh, and left the aviation sector, I have to say, I work for airline, uh, a bit like Adolfo, and for me it was a discovery of how diverse and great it can be. I think some of my best friends are still some of my colleagues from my time at the time. It was awesome. And then I moved to another sector of aviation that was absolutely not diverse, where I felt that there was no place for someone like me. So speaking with you now today, I'm having hope, not for me, I'm too late, I'm too old now, but for my nieces, that they will be able, if they think about aviation in the future, which is not the case for the moment, obviously, but uh, if they think about aviation, that there will be a place for them. So thank you for that uh, on a personal level. Uh, on the moderator level, it was a great conversation to have. Thank you for your time and sharing your experience. Um, what I memorize is kind of outside all the strategy and process and vision of diversity, that we are all agents of change, that we have to look for diverse uh, environment to work with, but we also have to push our environment to be more diverse uh, and, and take our leaders accountable for that. Um, because it's the best way for us as individual and others to uh, to be able to be uh, us himself. And also on the unconscious bias, I think in everything, unconscious bias is really important, but everything has to come from a place of empathy, uh, even a difficult conversation. And as long as you always try to go and understand something from a place of empathy, you will never go wrong. So please increase your, uh, your level of emotional intelligence. And I'll pass it on back to Daniel. Mm -hmm. Yep, so we'll finish up there. So just uh, finally, just thanks to Isabel for moderating today and Adolfo, Jerry, Brian and Jason for um, taking their time to, to participate on our panel today. Um, once again, if anybody does have any questions, uh, please address them to info at iasa.aero. Um, and thanks again for, for tuning in to both part one and part two of our diversity and inclusion panel. It was it, both great discussions um, and it was great to have you all on, on today. So thanks a million again. And sorry, so I saw Jerry posted something. He said, uh, uh, "Oh, so my, 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 when I when I took off my headset, I went on mute. I just wanted to say uh, uh, what I ended with was best of luck to everybody." I said, "Aviation needs needs everybody. You know, nothing just call. We need a stream of talent coming through. And obviously, everyone here is listening in or win the DCU program has that talent and ability. And uh, just wishing everyone stays healthy. I know it's difficult times in Ireland, but keep your keep your head down and your heart up." Thank you. And whatever is your gender, sexual orientation, race, social status, there is a place for you in aviation. And to answer yep. to Maria Pia Kelly question, more female speaker, it was on purpose. This is not a manals. Uh, the first diversity and inclusion panel was all female. And just to be more diverse and inclusive, we did an all panelist male with me as a moderator. So there was not uh, something that we forsake. ISI is very conscious of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks Thank as well. Appreciate Thank it. Everybody. Take care. Thank everybody. you for your time. Thanks, bye bye. Everyone. Stay safe. Thanks, Thanks very much, all of you.